Hi, Lenny. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to episode 54 of the Front Porch Book Club. The Front Porch Book Club is a podcast that meets twice a month. We like to dig deep into the relationship between characters and the worlds they live in. Grab your book and iced tea and join us on the Front Porch. Lenny, we're recording this on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, sis. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to you, too. Thank you. And this is kind of a funny book to discuss on Mother's Day because this is a nonfiction book called Far From the Tree by Andrew Solomon. It was a best selling book. It tells the stories of families who are raising exceptional children who not only learn to deal with the challenges of raising these children who are very different from they are, but also find profound meaning in doing so. The author is Andrew Solomon. He has a PhD and he's a writer and lecturer on politics, culture, psychology. He is the winner of the National Book Award and an activist in LGBTQ rights mental health, and the arts. He is a professor of clinical medical psychology and psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center, a lecturer in psychiatry at Yale University, and a former president of Penn American Center. So I think that this will be an interesting episode for anyone who has ever been a child. I believe that would be us. (laughs) (laughs) Or who has been a parent of a child, also us, speaking of Mother's Day. (laughs) (laughs) And I think people will be interested in this book because Solomon explores the many ways that children are different from their parents. And in this book, he's really dealing with extreme cases of difference. Six chapters deal with categories of difference that have been long classified as illnesses, and four chapters deal with more socially constructed difference. So the six long classified illness chapters cover children who are deaf, those who are dwarfs, those who have Down syndrome, autism, schizophrenia, and other disabilities. Then the socially constructed differences cover children who are prodigies, the product of rape, those who commit crimes, and those who are transgender. So what's interesting about him is he spends 10 years interviewing 300 families for this yeah. book. Uh, most of the families are from America and Britain. And each chapter, he explores a set of questions dealing with all of these different issues. For this book, we read both the first chapter, which is really covers a lot of his backstory, his interests, and his takeaway. Yeah gives you a framework for reading the rest of the book and what he thinks is a ability or a disability and differences and how he grew up different from his parents and how they shaped him or tried to shape him. And then we we both selected a couple of chapters to really focus our discussion on. So this is really going to be fun and different for us to kind of take this book apart and discuss these issues. Well, so let's start with the overall premise of the book. His thesis is that in large part, people have children to perpetuate themselves. Well, absolutely. I think we do, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but very specifically, not to just perpetuate the human race, but to create little mini me's. Yeah. Is that just self-evident to you? Yes. (laughs) So that's not so self-evident. Oh, okay. (laughs) To me, I don't know. <laughs> that's so yeah. funny. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so you're totally on board with him then. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yeah, okay. So he says parents raise children to be like them, to share their values and attributes. So here's a quote from the first chapter. He says, From the beginning, we tempt them, and here he's talking about our children, we tempt them into imitations of us and long for what may be life's most profound compliment. They're choosing to live according to our own system of values. Though many of us take pride in how different we are from our parents, we are endlessly sad at how different our children are from us. This stuns me that you were like, yeah, of course we have children to have little mini-me's. 
I actually don't really remember thinking that I was going to have a child to have a mini me. I will tell you, I do remember when we were thinking about having a child, I thought, well, if we have a son, I hope he's a lot like Brian, my husband, because Brian is such a wonderful person. But beyond that, I didn't really have that much of an image, I think, of our son being like little mini versions of us. Maybe more I had an image of him being the best of both of us, which is an impossible thing to think your child is going to be the the best of both of you. But I'm not sure I felt as strongly as Solomon seems to convey that we wanted a little imitation of us. I, I think I recognized that our child might be really different from us. And I thought he probably would introduce us to all sorts of experiences that we knew nothing about. And that has been the case. Uh Well, I think what you said is he wanted the best of both of us. And that's kind of what I envisioned for my son too. Yeah. But I took it way, way past that. I know, I figured I knew what he was going to look like. Oh, he's going to have, oh, I really hope he has my eyes. Eric's this, mine, you know, da, 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 da. I had a face in mind. And when he came out, he had exactly the opposite of what I had visioned. (laughs) Really? I'm telling you, I was like, this is a stranger. Wow. So I will take it kind of to the other extreme that it was like that. But then in raising this child who was very different than me. Yeah. That always hit me square between the eyes. This is not me. This is somebody very different from me that I'm raising. And I've got to figure out how am I going to raise this child? That is so different from me in so many ways. Yeah. So it's obvious to me that I sort of had that in mind. I thought, well, this is going to be a piece of cake. I had to raise kids. But it was hard and it was challenging because he was very different than me. Well, that's interesting because it also like makes me think of Venus and Serena Williams and their father, for example. He, I think his idea was, I'm going to have these girls and they're going to learn how to play tennis, and they're going to become famous tennis players. And they did. And I think of Tiger Woods and his father. I'm going to have this little boy, and I'm going to teach him how to golf, and he's going to become a famous golfer. So I think for some parents, they have a very specific image for their child. And that child does really conform with that image. Oh, mine didn't. Yeah. Well, but that's that is that's interesting. <laughs> but I was also wise enough to know this child's different than me. That's the thing. You have to take the child that you have and you have to raise the child that you have. You have to be the parent your child needs. They can't conform to you. You have to take them as they come. And then your a job as the parent is to figure out, okay, this is what I have. Now what am I gonna do with it? How do I parent this? And help this child along to be the best version of themselves that they can be. Yeah. And I think Solomon is probably from his own experience saying he was not the child his parents wanted, specifically he was gay, and they tried to make him conform to what they wanted for him rather than doing what you're saying. And that is acknowledging, look, our child is gay. We, we don't happen to be gay. We happen to be heterosexual. So now we are going to enter into his world. Rather, they said, no, we don't accept that about you. We're going to try to make you like us. Uh-huh. Yeah, he talks about these vertical and horizontal differences. And I yeah. thought that that was... That was really good. I I liked that. The vertical is like things that we have that are like our parents. They might, at least a small child might share their religion, their ethnicity, unless they're adopted, their DNA. They're going to be similar to the parents in some ways. The horizontal ones are things that are different. So in other words, he had the horizontal as he was gay, but that was an emerging development for him too. So he wasn't always clear to his mom. I mean, I thought that he did a pretty good job depicting a mom that loved him very much, that went a hundred percent forward doing the best she could raising him. Yeah. But kind of like 
trying to figure stuff out too, but he was figuring stuff out about it. Yeah, but like he wanted, as a little boy, he wanted the pink balloon. And his mother yeah. was like, you, basically, you cannot have the pink balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite color is blue. You're going to have the blue balloon. <laughs> yeah. That's she did do stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a different time too, Nance. Definitely. I think he was born the same year I was. And so as I was tracking along his personal journey and what he said was the context of his coming to understand his sexuality and some of the barriers along the way. Yeah, I was kind of tracking thinking, yeah, in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, those were different times all the way to present, which is a whole different environment. Yeah, people wouldn't think anything of a child walking down the street at any color pulling the hat. That would... Exactly. So it's interesting that you said when you had your son, you looked at him and you were like, wait a second, this is not what I expected my son to look like. This is a stranger. And Solomon uses that same terminology. He says, parenthood abruptly catapults us into a permanent relationship with a stranger and the more alien the stranger the stronger the whiff of negativity so you're asking i think that i think because he looked different did that hurt or help my bonding maybe initially physically because i was like i don't think this is mine but <laughs> this is um, it's got to be mine but what there was immediately was commitment. Yeah. This one's mine. I'm 100% and 10, both feet in. This is mine. Whether he looks like me or not, this is mine. Now think about somebody who's, who gives birth to somebody who has a serious disability. Right. They can tell the disability from the moment that baby comes and lays on their belly or chest. That wasn't my case or my experience, but I can understand that. You're still going to have that love. You're still going to have that commitment. I like that he says all kinds of attributes make one less able. And so talking about physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. So he says illiteracy and poverty are disabilities. So are stupidity, obesity, and boringness. Extreme age and extreme youth are both disabilities. Faith is a disability insofar as it constrains you from self-interest. Atheism is a disability inasmuch as it shields you from hope. One might see power as disability, too, for the isolation which it imprisons those who wield it. I thought this was interesting, too, that he says, look, I just picked these grouping of illnesses and socially constructed disabilities, but there are many, many ways that children are different from their parents and many ways that that can be a barrier. Right. Because they're not like their parents. So thinking about the balloon and this boy, we're all different from each other. And he talks about that. We're differently abled yeah. than one another. And then the parents are left with the decision of which do you protect and which do you indulge. So right. with the balloon concept, you're like, maybe that's something I'm not going to indulge, but I don't want anybody harassing them or saying anything. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of let her off the hook a little bit, except for he remembers the story. So it was important to him. He really wanted the pink balloon. It took that seed plus a lot of other little ones along the way to realize wait a second, I'm liking what other people might not like. And so I am different than other little boys that are, that are typical. And I think for him, the pink balloon was even more than that. It was that my mother does not approve of who I am. Uh -huh. So it wasn't just recognition, I'm different, but... It's not acceptable. Yeah. Something is different because he wasn't really accepting his sexuality. I think kids nowadays probably have an easier time with it. At least that's what I see mm -hmm. in my little world. But back then, you might not have even known what gay was. Just to kind of try to put some pieces of the puzzle together yeah. for himself. This also made me think of 
kids who are first generation college students who go off to school and you know most people would say well that's a that's a good thing furthering your education but how that can be a real difference and create a separation from their families because suddenly they are having experiences they are getting this education that the rest of the family might resent, might not understand, might be afraid of, like there's all kinds of issues. It seems to me, he doesn't explicitly say it, but it seems to me his thesis is kind of around what happens when parental expectation isn't met for whatever reason, and then that causes some sort of break or separation between the parent-child bond. What, what do you think about that as a shorthand description of this book? Yeah, that, that's a pretty good synopsis. I was thinking of the first generation college student, and it really is the expectation too, because yeah. a lot of it is a lot of hopes and dreams. We came to this country to put a better life in front of you. You will be a doctor or a lawyer because nothing else will work. You will get straight A's and you're going to get a good job because you've got three kids behind you that don't have college. We put it all on you. And now you got to support the next ones coming along. And it's a lot of expectations of what we want for you. Of course, we all want children who are happy and healthy and all those kinds of things. But this takes it to a different level Mm -hmm. of setting those expectations. So I say, Nance, kudos to you. Good summary. (laughs) It's kind of a thick book. (laughs) It's a very thick book. And in terms of the first generation college students, I was thinking, less of the parents who are saying, yeah, this is our expectation for you. We're an immigrant family. You need to be either a doctor or a lawyer. You pick, you get to choose, but it's going to be a doctor or a lawyer. But I'm thinking more uh, families who the family has never had a member go to college. Could be poverty, could be lots of reasons, but no one in their family has ever aspired to college. I think one of the children that was interviewed in this book, I think he called it the poppy syndrome or something. Like he popped up a little bit taller, a little bit brighter than everyone else. And you really risk getting cut off at the knees if you try to pop up and achieve more than what your family's expectations are when they're lower expectations. Right. Absolutely. It hits both ways for sure. That it's different than your parents. You're, you're different than your parents' values. All of a sudden, this one wants education as a high value. Really? Well, what is hard work? What do I do as a bricklayer? That's hard work. So are you judging who I am? So parents build up with their own sense of identity and wanting for their kids. And, and that's what this whole thing is about, this whole book. Mm-hmm. You read the chapters on schizophrenia and crime And I read the chapter on prodigies and then the final chapter about his journey to becoming a father. So my question for you is, why did you select the chapters on schizophrenia and crime? Well, I like schizophrenia. (laughs) (laughs) Of all of the mental illnesses out there, I kind of like that one. And really, when you're looking at a lot of the other categories, that was the only one that was really mental disability. So that's in my wheelhouse. Crime, you and I have talked about crime before. Yeah. The crime chapter was interesting because it talked about juveniles and the juvenile justice system. There are no easy answers in it and sounds like there aren't too many places doing a really good job with reform. Right. I was just interested to hear what his take is I have not read a lot on the parents' thoughts about children who are juveniles. It's mostly thoughts on who are these kids, what's going on with them, how did they get to this point, and how do we reform, what do we do. We have a case here in Red Lion just down the road where a child, 13, killed a friend. Oh, no. But now he's in jail in our adult prison. Oh, no. That's why I picked those. You picked Prodigies, which I thought was a good one for you. Why'd you pick Prodigies? I was really intrigued when I saw Prodigies on the list because 
it would never have dawned on me to think that having a prodigy would be something children and parents would really experience separation over. Because I think we think, well, I don't know, if you're smart, that's just an unalloyed good. Whereas things like crime and illness, we tend to think of, oh, that's too bad. That's a problem. Whereas, I don't know, if you're really smart, that seems like a good thing. So I was really interested in what he had to say about prodigies and what I was missing in terms of thinking about that as difference. Oh, okay. And then I read the final chapter, the father chapter, because I was interested in the whole arc of in chapter one, learn about his experience as a son. So I was interested in kind of finishing that arc and seeing at the end of the book, uh, how had he changed through this experience and then his experience reflecting on being a father himself. Mm. So should we start with schizophrenia? Let's start with schizophrenia (laughs) since it's your favorite mental illness. (laughs) Talk about an arc. Schizophrenia has had some kind of arc, too. In preparation of talking to you today about schizophrenia, I thought of Hidden Valley Road right away. Yes. That was our book about a year ago, Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Kolker. I loved that book because it did take schizophrenia through the decades, through pharmacology, through, oh, the mother caused this to really examining in a longitudinal way decades of this one family with all these children, 12, and six of them developed schizophrenia, I believe. Yep. So I I reminded myself of that as always reading through this. This is different from that book because it is only one chapter, not the entire book. Right. It does talk a little bit about the development, the kind of how this mental illness has been perceived through time. It does talk a little bit about the phases that people go through with schizophrenia and some of the genetic stuff Mm -hmm. that was also in the Colker book. But mostly he just takes talking to all of these parents. Okay, so here's one of the things that's different about this. People usually don't become schizophrenic or at least get that diagnosis until they're out of the house. Right. <laughs> at least in part. Right. You know, that somebody down syndrome, maybe even before they're born. Right. Or have some kind of physical disabilities now very early on. So this one is different in the fact that this was this boy growing up. This is how we raised him. And then something happened when he went to college. Right. Or we started seeing by senior year, maybe he had a lot of stress. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He was drinking a little too much or whatever. So this is kind of stands alone from other aspects of the book quite a lot. So what he did was he he basically then used these life stories. And again, this is going to be more of a horizontal difference. The people that look in the genetics of this stuff say, there's something hereditary going on here. However, the majority of schizophrenics do not have schizophrenic parents. Yeah. But there's got to be something that's passed through genetically, whether it's um, a recessive gene. And he talks a little bit about how does this happen? What are we looking at here? With schizophrenia, it's much more complicated. And that's why still research needs to be done on this. There's no real easy answers here. It's challenging for parents because even though we would say these kids are young adults or adults, all of a sudden the parents are going to have to take some more ownership over this child than what a lot of parents do is, hey, are you coming home for Christmas with our kids to college? (laughs) Or they start working, when are we going to see you next? Can we fly out? How can we connect? All of a sudden, these parents are thrown back into day to day. What's going on with my child? They're still my child. What do they need? How do I support them? Running around, maybe even bathing them, dealing with some really strong, tough issues. 
So very different than the other chapters of the book. Yeah, it seems like this would be such a difficult illness to deal with because you're right. At the onset of this might be when you feel like as a parent, you've launched them. My child's yeah. off to Yale. Oh, they did so well in this sport. They've got a scholarship to this college. And yeah. they've had this whole lifetime of bonding with their child mm -hmm. and seeing their child hopefully excel. And some people are just average too. But the book is stories of kids that were very charismatic, very sports minded, very good at something, you know, and the parents are proud and they send, they make it to college and they send them off and, and just so much like the Hidden Valley book, although those kids had some cracks earlier than what is typical. Yeah, but the so, oldest one didn't so much. It was like the oldest he, one. He was great in high school. Yeah. And then there was still something there. Yeah. They just ignored it. Yeah. But he was he was that very charismatic young man, great at sports. Yeah. And then suddenly you're not involved in their day-to-day -day life anymore and things start falling apart. And then you think, is it just drugs or they're just right. lonely or they just need to attend a college closer to the home? Because right. when you sent them away, they were fine. So you thought. Yeah. And neurologically, they could have been. But something yeah. sparks, something falls apart, and you're now faced in the role of caretaking. And now you're caretaking an adult, and in terms of legal and medical interventions and trying to figure out how much guardianship are you really going to have, can you exercise, that just becomes even a huge legal issue. Yeah. And it's in an area where few people have that experience because it's still very set aside. He did make one parallel to autism in that way, because people have a little baby that girls and spits up and needs the diaper changed and goo goos and gagas, and maybe even start saying their first words on time. Or early even. They're hitting some milestones. And around two, there gets to be a little bit of a concern, or maybe yeah. three. Huh, they're yeah. not doing what they used to do. The right. child isn't looking at it. So they sometimes have that early bonding, too, different than the other mm -hmm. differences that he talks about in this book. But boy, mm -hmm. by the time your child's going off to college, you think, oh, got that one done. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. I'm good. Let me know when you want me to come up and take you out for a meal. Right. My parent weekend is. You know? Right. <laughs> See you at Christmas. This is uh, devastating, obviously. Yeah. For a lot of parents and can be a lot for parents to take on. Mm, definitely. Well, and like the same is true with autism, too. You think here I am, I've bonded with this little person. I'm starting to get to know them. A lot of kids with autism, they might be even seeming very advanced uh -huh. from their peers. And I think that's so devastating. Again, maybe it's the reinforcement of certain expectations. And then it feels like all of a sudden, something has changed and just stolen that from you. And the child is very different than what you thought you had been experiencing. Yeah, he, he talks about that too with schizophrenia. It's like he's lost. Yeah. You see parts of it there, maybe the adult that's developing schizophrenia or has that diagnosis may always really be good in tennis as long as they're present. Yeah. It's still the same physical thing. I'm going to get out there and smack the ball around. There's pieces of their personality that may still be there. And certainly they don't look schizophrenic if they're taking their meds and they're doing well on that. They look like anybody else. Same thing with autism. Well, you can tell somebody has dwarfism or if somebody has Down syndrome. Right. When someone has autism and they're having a fit in the grocery store, people walk by and go, they don't know how to parent their child. They have the vertical thing along with their parents, but the thing that's horizontal is now this mental illness or this physical difference or things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall we talk about prodigies? I think we shall. Okay. What'd you learn, Nance? 
Well, I learned a lot about prodigies. He defines prodigies as children who are able to function at an advanced adult level in some domain before the age of 12. So I thought that was very helpful. Okay. We're not just talking about gifted kids. We're not just talking about... Who gets to take AP physics? <laughs> exactly. We're not talking about AP physics here. <laughs> We're talking... We're talking about the kids that... Are going to college when they're 11. You're playing Mozart at age five. <laughs> exactly. About sheet music. You just heard that and right. you can play that. <laughs> That's exactly the kid we're talking about, right? <laughs> so he says, being gifted and being disabled are surprisingly similar, isolating, mystifying, petrifying. Uh -huh. And he reinforces this by reminding us that the word prodigy comes from the Latin word prodigium, which means monster that violates the natural order. He distinguishes, too, a prodigy from a genius. And the difference here is in timing. A prodigy, again, before the age of 12, they are extremely excelling at something. A genius may be someone who develops that kind of advanced aptitude as they are growing physically. So a person might be a genius at something, but by the time people are calling them geniuses, like Einstein, maybe they're in their 30s or 40s. Uh -huh. That was all helpful. He works really hard to get us to understand how prodigies are similar to children with more traditionally understood differences. He says, like a disability, prodigiousness compels parents to redesign their lives around the special needs of their child. Once more, experts must be called in. Once more, their primary strategies for dealing with the aberrance often undermine parental power. A child's prodigiousness requires his parents to seek out a new community of people with similar experience. They soon face the mainstreaming dilemma and must decide whether to place their children with intellectual peers too old to befriend them or with age peers who will be bewildered and alienated by their achievements. Brilliance can be as much of an impediment to intimacy as any developmental anomaly. So he says prodigiousness manifests most often in just four areas, athletics, mathematics, chess, and music. And in this chapter, he mostly focuses on music. And he's very clear. He says, look, I'm focusing on music because I really know a lot about music and I don't know anything <laughs> about these other areas. And then he's mostly focusing on the world of classical music. And again, I think that that's because that's the music that he understands. Okay. So that's the setup. I just was not sure that prodigies fit into this category about difference and separation. And again, I just think about expectation. I think most parents aren't expecting to have a prodigy, but it seems to me when these parents understand, oh, wait, yeah, my two-year-old is sitting at the piano and playing Mozart, it's not so much that their expectations are dashed, but rather it, the challenge is that their expectations may overwhelm the child and who the child is. So it seems like the parents who ended up damaging their child are those who want to exploit that prodigiousness or channel it in ways that is damaging to the child. Like they are, they are seeking monetary gain or fame. And maybe the argument is the same as, as the one you are making. I mean, it's just a very different kind of separation. And I will tell you that for many of the prodigies that were interviewed, there really was a separation with their parents. So I guess that does argue for the presence of prodigiousness in this book, that parents were either pushing them too hard and were expecting more than the child felt like they could deliver. Like many parents seem to be expecting a level of perfection, for instance, in music, where in music, there, what is perfection? It doesn't even make sense. But there was this 
notion of perfection was expected and they could never achieve it. Or there were the parents who were preventing their children from pursuing a deep interest and the prodigy that they had, and that that also could end up creating a separation. I have seen prodigies from time to time. Okay. And I would say that they are difficult and challenging to raise because you don't have a mind map for them based on your own experiences. It's not that the child plays the piano for an hour a day, Mozart, and then goes in the backyard and play. Be it, like I said, being a parent is hard. When you have a difference, whether you call it ability or disability or however he wants to call it, it takes a lot more effort, a lot more pause, a lot more purposefulness. Mm -hmm. Am I doing the right thing? Because I don't have a map. And I think it's very healthy for people, like you said, to you need to connect with other people that are going through this or slightly increase. Oh, we went through that three years ago. This is what we did. This is what we wish we would have done. Yeah. Because it is challenging. And, and I see parents challenge with it. I remember my own challenges and my child's differences can feel very isolating. It can feel very much like I don't know if I'm doing a good job. You know, I think the key there is connectedness. And if we can all just take our child with what is given to us and then do our very best at, okay, this child is different than we are. Let me meet the child where he is and help him along. Easier said than done. I think most parents try to do that. Very yeah. challenging for the prodigy too. This chapter did make me think about Howard Gardner's Eight Intelligences. Oh, yes. I love those. Yeah. And so he really focuses on musical yeah. prodigy. But the eight intelligences, it seemed to me children could be prodigies in any of these. And so mm -hmm. the chapter felt very narrow because it only focused on musical prodigy. So the eight intelligences, just a reminder for everyone, they are visual, spatial, linguistic, verbal, logical, mathematical, body, kinesthetic, musical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalistic. And then a ninth intelligence has been suggested as an addition, and that's existential. And so it seems to me that it's easy to focus on music because that seems like a career path to fortune and fame, as really would be body kinesthetic for kids who are very early. They're just moving their body different. You can see it right away. Yeah. <laughs> you can see it right away. They are athletes. They yeah. are just athletes yep. Yep. Um, and they're prodigies. But I, I thought these other areas would likewise perhaps be confusing for parents the child who has extremely good interpersonal skills and the parents are like, I don't understand. They don't listen to the teacher. She's talking to the girl right beside her all day long. <laughs> or the visual spatial, like my kid, all she wants to do is paint. It felt to me like there were some unexplored areas that we don't necessarily think of as prodigy. And I think it's because we don't think of it as a career path. I don't think people think, oh, well, they're going to become a famous painter because at least in our culture, we don't really have that so much. Now, if they were living in Renaissance times, yes, we would send them to the Vienna school or Italy or yes, but that's just not a favored career path. Well, I, you know, Nance, I think this Gardner thing is about intelligence. Mm-hmm. I've always looked at this Gardner thing is where are your gifts? Yeah. And that's different than I think what he's talking about with this prodigy thing. But couldn't you be a prodigy in any intelligence? No, I don't think. Well, possibly. See, I think so. See, I think if, if you're looking at these things and I've taken little tests 
I don't know why you're taking tests because I know where your intelligence <laughs> is. But well, so, you can just ask me, but go ahead. Okay. So, like, I've taken those. Yeah. But I'm not a prodigy. In no, that I'm not saying that people who have any of those intelligence are prodigies. I'm saying there could be prodigiousness in any of those intelligences. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. We don't think of the kid who is always thinking existential thoughts as being a prodigy. That probably feels like a real separation because it doesn't seem like a career. It seems like that kid, what is going on? They just are always talking about what is the meaning of life, like crazy stuff. Yeah. That's just the connection you make between the two. All right. So let's talk about crime. Ah. <laughs> From prodigy to crime. Yep. Oh, my. Well, the thing about crime, and maybe the, the reason that I picked it, Nance, is because three out of four incarcerated juveniles have a mental disability. Uh, it's so... Diagnoses. Yeah, it's just tragic that prisons are our largest mental health system in the United States. Yeah. And just about exactly opposite of what they need. Yes. So I guess I picked it because, first of all, we've talked a lot about crime with a, a previous book that we read. Well, that was the Van Jones. He had a big chapter on crime. Yes. And thinking about this little boy down the street who's just not, he's not even in high school. He's a kid. I don't know. Your frontal lobe isn't very developed then. No. He didn't buy that gun. Uh. His parents had it unlocked. It was just sitting around home. But again, we're talking about the horizontal and the vertical differences. Yes, there are some children who commit these crimes that have come from bad families or families that you would have like more of a vertical thing. Yeah, my dad's in drugs and I'm doing drugs and we're all doing drugs together. He does cover a wide range of things from just assaulting people mm -hmm. to people that are committing murder and rape. And mass murder. So what does that do to the family? Again, this is hitting maybe later in life. So you're right. already bonded with this child. So what do you do with 75% mm, of them have mental illness? Do we believe in solitary confinement for these children? Because that's what we're doing. In some states, in some incidences, do we believe in physical restraint? There are less kind of rules or principles surrounding how do you treat a minor in this situation than there is adults. Interesting. They need to take ownership and responsibility for what they did. But what we want is for these kids to get better and turn their lives around and move forward. It's kind of a nitty gritty, hard chapter to read. There's a lot of work that needs to be done that he is putting out there for, for society to face to say, is this what we want? At least that's how I read it. So a very different chapter again. Different chapter, I think, yeah. Yeah, it's like each chapter is just so different in yeah. what he's talking about and the experiences. All right, well, the final chapter that either of us read, I read the father chapter and this final chapter is primarily autobiographical, like the first was. He recounts how he became a father and how his research into this book informed that experience. One quote is, he says, I started this book to forgive my parents and ended it by becoming a parent. Understanding backward liberated me to live forward. So I thought that was interesting that he felt so damaged by the experience of growing up that he felt working through this book would help him do that. And becoming a parent was really a difficult decision for him because of the damage that he felt that he experienced. He didn't think that he would be a good father he didn't particularly like kids because when he was growing up, kids were really mean to him. I mean, there were just kind of a lot of things, but he ends up becoming a parent and feeling very fulfilled. Does he feel like he was, he's being a good dad? But his, his child is still very young. He's 
through this experience, I think, pledging that he will not let difference separate him from the child. So he he wants to put into practice some of the things that he's learned through this mm-hmm. book. Very good. Yeah. One more power to him. What did you think of the book overall? Who would you recommend it for? I guess I would kind of read it the way we would read it. Yeah. Like get the underbelly of the book down. Understand who this guy is, what he is coming to the table from, what does he have to offer? kind of his own language of of this vertical and horizontal differences and what parents want for their children and how parents typically raise the kids. And then when there's some kind of difference, what his thoughts are on that and any insights into parenting that you can gain from it. But I think I'm going to say from the schizophrenic point of view and the, the crime, and I, I, I will even say from the homosexuality, because that first chapter is his grip on his life yeah. and his emerging sexuality, that it, I think is affirming people to realize there are other families that are working through whatever it is that you're working through. So even though the book is quite thick, I think you could be happy saying, hey, my child falls under one of these categories. Let me read chapter one. And now let me read what other parents are saying about raising their child who has Down syndrome Mm -hmm. or their child who has committed some horrible crimes or their child who has struggled in this way. And then let me take from that what is helpful to me. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Nance? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think the book is almost a thousand pages, at least the hardback. I agree. I think that picking and choosing makes a lot of sense. And over and over, at least in the chapters that I read, he talked so much about, I felt so much affinity for these children, for instance, like the prodigies, because their experience felt so much like mine, even though mine was because I am gay. And I felt so much affinity for children who are deaf, because they were separated from their parents and the the parents wanted them to get the cochlear Im- implants, but they didn't want to. They're like, no, this is who I am. So I over and the way I am. Yeah. yeah. So over and over again, he reinforces that this whole idea of difference is unifying in a lot of ways and that parents and children aren't alone because there can be lots of different sorts of differences. But again, it's that kind of separation and how can parents and children reach across that chasm and find acceptance and love and even meaning in those differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good point. I'm glad you brought that point up about It was because of who he was that he reached out to these other groups to learn more about about them and saw that they were kind of all into it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were all different in some way. Yeah. Okay. Well, interesting book. Yeah. Yeah, we're only doing one drop on this book. That's right. We did three on the the last one. (laughs) That's right. We had to go to Afghanistan three times and figure that out. Right. So we're only going to do this book with you and I talking about it. Then we'll be back on our regular schedule. Right. So in June, we're going to discuss Our Missing Hearts by Celeste Ng. This instant New York Times bestselling novel introduces us to 12-year-old Bird, that's the date, <laughs> whose mother disappeared and whose books of poetry have been banned. A mysterious letter and drawing sets him on a quest to find her. Ooh. Sounds great. Yeah, so we're looking forward to doing that. Definitely. Well, thanks for listening. Our website is frontporchbookclub.com. If you enjoy our podcast, tell a friend about it. We'd love to reach more listeners who love books. Another way to help us is to give us a five-star review on whatever podcast platform you listen to us on. If you're not sure how to do that, go to our website where we give you step-by-step instructions at the bottom of our homepage. (laughs) Great. Our episodes come out twice a month on the first and third Wednesday of every month. Okay. See you next time, (laughs) man. See you then.